folks. Today is Thursday, May 30th, 2019. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, the family of the man who died in Sheriff David Clark's jail receives a historic settlement. That punk-ass sheriff hasn't said anything. Oh, all hat, no cattle, huh? Let's see what he got to say now. New evidence that the census was deliberately manipulated by the Donald Trump administration to hurt Democrats and it's also because of race. We will unpack that thing. Bob Mueller speaks, and Lord, Donald Trump is losing his damn mind. See what happens when you've been lying, obstructing justice, and rep all you MAGA lovers are losing their minds, saying, oh, now Bob Mueller's a bad guy. But I thought y'all got cleared. Oh, it's amazing what happens when the truth comes out. And we know Donald Trump is lying. He lies all day, and so we got some new lies for him. Joining us on the show today is Jamie Harrison. Uh, he is a man trying to unseat uh, South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham, who has decided to suck up to Donald Trump every way possible. Can this brother turn South Carolina blue? Also, we'll talk to uh, Martellus Bennett. First of all, they got the script, former Dallas Cowboy, but y'all know I hate the Dallas Cowboys. He's a former Texas A&M graduate. That's more like it. He's here to motivate black boys. Never put that Cowboy stuff in a damn script on the show I got. And there's more trouble for the cast and crew of The Shy. Seems that there's more to be more to the story about what we heard so far regarding Jason Mitchell. And guess what? R. Kelly facing new charges in Chicago. We also have a preview of Ava DuVernay's drama series, When They See Us, about the Central Park Five. You know, the crew that Donald Trump said should get the death penalty? We'll break all of that down. Jam-packed show. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's Uncle Roro, -Ro, y'all. Yeah, yeah. It's Roland Martin, yeah. All right, folks, so the former sheriff in Milwaukee County, David Clark, has uh, his inaction in his jail has led to the family of Terrell Thomas getting $7 million. Thomas died of dehydration in Sheriff Clark's jail when he was denied water for seven days. The family attorney described his death as torture. While in jail, his water turned off because he supposedly flooded another cell by stuffing a mattress in the toilet. Well, the water was never turned back on, and he died a week later. Now, of course, David Clark is no longer the sheriff there, uh, and, of course, he has nothing to say about this. It's no shock whatsoever. Uh, but this also speaks to the kind of treatment that we see uh, in jails uh, across this country. We want to talk about this here with our pal joining us right now is a former NFL player, Texas A&M player, Martellus Bennett, Dr. Greg Carr, Chair, Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University. Also joining us is Theresa Lundy, founder of TML Communications, and, of course, the loudmouth himself, the loud, the loudmouth Kappa, a. Scott so Bolden, only. former chair of National Bar Association Political Action Committee, but it's two alphas here, so we'll Thank keep you, we'll keep we'll keep the little kappa in order. Oh, uh, uh, I, I want to start. So, so stop talking. Stop here talking. Here's the thing that's crazy about this here. Here you got Sheriff Clark running his mouth, talking about being a fiscal conservative, loving Donald Trump, uh, and now the Trump people have actually kicked him to the curb. Uh, and he's such a whip. He even blocked me on Twitter because he don't want to debate me like the fo other Fox News people. But this is a guy. He literally. He literally. Uh, kept water from this guy. This guy was over the jail, and he didn't care. He didn't care. His brother died. And in fact, four people died in his jail under his leadership watch. I mean, it's ridiculous. He, he's shown that he has no regard for human life. He's got a long track record of abuse. Uh, last time I saw David Clark, he was sitting in the studio when you posted him up in there. He didn't know you were going to call him online in the air. And, 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 and he just turned around, and at one point, he kind of smiled. He broke character. He knows this is wrong. Fortunately, a court of law also has, you know, enforced that it's wrong. But, but this just talks, it really spe speaks to the deep cynicism in the GOP at this point. And they'll use anybody until they won't. Ben Carson's probably next. They're going to kick them both to the curb. Martellus, we've got a bunch of other stories of, again, people uh, being beaten, attacked in prison. Uh, and there's a, just this gross disregard for people who are in prison. And unfortunately, too many other people say, oh, they deserve to be there. Who cares? Even though they might be in prison, they're still human beings. Yeah, I think there's a 
people, when they look at someone for what they did, they don't really think about growth. You think about reform, prison reform, or you think about the ability to change people and how people could change. There's no put anything is not nothing's put in place for grow people as they're in prison. They go there and they're forgotten. They get lost in the shuffle. There has to be something where they continue to be educated and continue to be to continue to grow as people. That's the biggest thing. Like no one should really be punished forever. They could learn and they could grow and they should be able to show how much they have grown and how much they have learned. Well, you, well, you can't growth. learn and grow here because he's dead. Well, well, you need, you know, it's interesting you talk about growth, but the reality is the, the, the captors, the oppressors, the police, the prosecutors need room for growth too because none of this is personal. And you know, as a former prosecutor from New York and criminal defense lawyer, when I would have clients who would come in and clearly look like they've been abused from head to shoulders and what have you, mm. we would ask the pictures be taken of them in court. This happens every day in courtrooms and jails across this country. You just don't necessarily hear about it. And that needs to be reformed because I can see it, I can report it, I can put it on the record and what have you. But these prisoners, these young kids, older prisoners, you name it, that, that are processed through the court system or they're at Rikers Island and come, uh, they're not only abused in prison but abused on the way there. And because they're prisoners, because they are accused of having crimes, nobody really cares. And their public defenders are very limited as well. And then the prosecutors, if you care, that's one thing. Most really don't, de facto don't. And so they're caught up in this uh, political and criminal justice vortex that won't let them go. They get lucky if they can get out, if they have money for bail, or if they beat the charge, right? Mm. That alone should be enough for them not to go back to prison. Teresa, what, you what you're dealing with is, again, we have a society in this case uh, where th this, uh, this fake black man, uh, David Clark, uh, <laughs> treated inmates as if they were nothing. Sort of like uh, Sheriff Arpaio uh, in uh, Arizona. It's probably who he wanted to model after. This guy's dead. This is not somebody who was injured, right. went to the hospital. He's dead. Right, and Sheriff Clark treated them as they were slaves, treated them, uh, these prisoners, these humans, these brothers, these nephews, like they were forgotten, like they were lost, like um, they went to sentence and then they pretty much got sentenced to death under his ruling. So. When I see the GOP kind of toss him to the side and by the waistline, I'm, I'm actually glad because I hope it's a wake-up call to every African-American that is under the GOP, GOP, especially as the administration signed a criminal justice bill. Um, but as we can see, that it's trickling down to some of those law enforcement that's agencies. The feds too. It's absolutely it's not even at the state level, and they're more state prisoners than federal prisoners. And, right. of, course, and of course, we haven't heard anything from Candace Owens or the other black people who love running their mouths. <laughs> and you won't, because, because it, I think everybody's taking a reevaluation of themselves, especially you know African Americans who are a part of the. Not field. them. I mean, they not them. No, they not. not. I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm no, they not. Because they're Teresa, no, they not. No, they not. We don't know. They, what they're they're not. They're silent because they don't want to speak to this issue because it speaks to their gross negligence. And also, right. it sure. also shows all these fake-ass conservatives who care about tax dollars. That's seven million dollars of taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, they don't see. They love talking about fiscal conservatism, but they don't care when Chicago spends half a billion on police settlements. Mm -hmm. They don't care when New York City spends almost a billion on police settlements. We can go on and on and on. Right. They don't care about any of that because, again, and they also don't care because they're also these fake-ass pro-lifers. <laughs> see, don't tell me you pro-life when it's a fetus, but then you not pro-life when somebody dies in a jail. Mm -hmm. And so this sh that's why they're silent because they have situational ethics and situational morals. Well, That's the deal. Greg, final comment before I go next It's story. interesting. There, there are about 1,250 majority black controlled cities in this country. I mean, run by black I mean, mayors, black, about 1,250, according mm -hmm. to Pew and some mm -hmm. other people. Milwaukee is one now with a plurality of black people. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing around the city is as black people gain control of some of these municipalities, you begin to see black political Doesn't power begin to see. Yeah. Well, in well, this is, like this? well, this is what okay, I'm saying. Okay, stop. First of all, this is one of the city. He was sheriff of the county. Right, but this is this is what I'm saying. Same difference. You, no, it's not the same no, no, no. difference. What I'm saying is that you can have a black city, and if you have other counties that are predominantly white, that's how he was able to win. That's where I was going. Well, because like Milwaukee the in the county and then the state of Wisconsin, a so-called swing state where you see this gerrymander issue, all these things we've been talking about, a guy like David Clark is backed up by those white supremacists in, in, in Wisconsin. Okay. And so when he drops down on the ground in a place like Milwaukee or in the county, he's being suborned by people who have absolutely no regard Precisely. for life. Right. Which is why they wanted him to run for the United States. They sent it, yes. right. of course, it went nowhere, that's and right. so that's what happens. That's right. See, so you read your research, you would know those things, Scott. All right, let's talk, talk about talk. Uh, the uh, <laughs> new evidence regarding the census. Thomas uh, Hofeller, the Republican Party's go to redistricting expert who died last year, he was the man we now.
now know behind the language that made it into the Justice Department's formal request that a citizenship question be added to the census. Now, let me unpack this. The evidence was found on a hard drive provided by his estranged daughter, who first shared it with the challengers in a partisan gerrymandering case in North Carolina. Documents show the Trump administration's purpose in putting the citizenship question on the upcoming census was not to help Hispanic voters under the Voting Rights Act, which they have lied about, but rather to create policy that would be a, quote, disadvantage to the Democrats and advantageous to Republicans and non-Hispanic whites. Now, this is a huge issue because the Supreme Court is going to decide this case. Trump folks have been lying. Y'all supposed to play the Trump Lives Matter uh, uh, stinger because they've been lying. They've been lying, lying, lying. Wilbur Ross lied in court, lied as to the origins of this. Lied in Congress, And then, too. This, then these fools who have never defended the Voting Rights Act. Right. All of a sudden, oh, we're doing this because of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I'm going to tell us, well, here's what we have here. The Republican Party is a white party. They got a few black people. Yeah. But the reality is... All of the attacks on immigration, the attacks on voter suppression, they are trying to maintain white majorities mm -hmm. in order to hold on to power. And this citizenship question is all about trying to hold his power for the next 10 years by keeping America white again. Yeah, a lot of, I mean, just through the history of time, everything has been to suppress the voters of color. No matter what color, black and brown people have not had to... It has not been as easy for them to vote, whether it's us fighting for the right to vote, the way they set up votes when it's during the day, where it's really just like a, a rich person's pastime where they could just go there and vote when they want to. Most people have jobs where they can't really get there to vote registration. They make everything really tough, and the language is written in a way where it's not uh, able to be digested by the normal person, normal citizen in the, the U.S. So they don't make it easy for people to learn what they need to go, and they not spread the information of what's act actually happened to make a vote. And then the other thing is people don't really vote locally either so everyone there's this huge thing about voting for the presidency that everyone wants to walk about and everyone wants to chant about and write about but then the actual voting for the places the things that happen in your community like there's not a lot of information about people knowing when those things are happening who's running who's running in your city those local um, things local chapters those things are going to matter even more to you and make a bigger impact right away than the, the grand votes of things so I think that the whole idea of voting has been it has been done in a way to discourage people who don't, who aren't white to vote. Teresa, they want to keep white majorities. Yeah. And they're hoping that the Supreme Court, led by five conservatives, including that so-called brother Clarence Thomas. Uh, now, yeah, and I'm saying so-called for a reason. And I'm questioning, yeah, I will question because of the positions that he takes. And they're hoping the Supreme Court will allow this citizenship question. And we know it's BS. And we also know that as a result of this, they lied. This guy wrote a memo, and they actually took the section in his own words and placed it in the Department of Justice's uh, letter to justify this uh, question. And so what I, I really hope that, kind of going back um, to his point, as in local municipalities actually try to do something, um, because we have some of those questions even on um, local elections during the primaries, is those local charter um, questions that are happening that really affect those um, individuals. Now, I know like in Philadelphia, we just had some that had to relate to um, um, uh, the school district's budget. And so even with that, I think, uh, and, and a lot of people just, you know, didn't know even understand the question. There was no history. There was no uh, <laughs> resources available to even find out the question, um, especially for the, the most impoverished city. And so I think, you know, when, when we're starting to look at a national scale with some of these uh, questions and, and, and Supreme Court statements, um, people just aren't having a better understanding, nor is it being explained. So, well, well, yes, well, well first of all, in this, in this case here, this, this is yeah. not a question in terms of a ballot initiative. What this is about is, is challenging the citizenship of individuals, even though the census uh, is about counting everybody. That's right. And see, well, how, what they also do, how they also how pimp this game, Scott, is that they will also use prisoners, count prisoners mm -hmm. for the purpose of the census, mm -hmm. count prisoners for the purpose of partisan gerrymandering, <laughs> but then say, oh, y'all also can't vote. Mm -hmm. And so what this particular question is about decreasing the number of Hispanics mm -hmm. in the country fearing that they're not going to answer the question, therefore shut the door, which means a decrease in federal resources right. and it impacts the, the, uh, the, the lines. Because what people don't realize is, is that based upon the census, if you have a population like in Texas, the last census, 
Texas added four new congressional seats because the population increased largely because of Latinos. <clears throat> well, that which means that you're going to have some losses. The losses when it comes to Congress, which also means electoral college losses. Come on. <laughs> okay. See, I need I need y'all to follow me on this thing. Mm -hmm. See, I know some of y'all at home going, oh my God, is it electoral college? Yes. What you need to understand, population shifts causes changes in congressional representation in the House. Senate stays the same. Everybody gets two, but it causes them in the House. Well, what are the states that are likely going to lose congressional representation over the next 20 years, which means loss of electoral college votes? Right. Ohio. Mm -hmm. right. Michigan. Michigan. Pennsylvania, <laughs> Wisconsin, right. all Midwestern states Rust where there are lots of white people, mm -hmm. the Rust Belt. Mm -hmm. And so for the people at home who, especially some of y'all Negroes out there, who are like, oh no, we shouldn't be uh, counting these folks. This is about <laughs> protecting white interests. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But everything has always it's been true. about protecting white interests. Oh no, no, absolutely. Oh, but, right. so, oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> but this, but, but what this is, no, right. what this is, it but, what, in but what this is, <laughs> because in 24 years <laughs> right. we'll be a nation majority of people of color. Exactly. Right. Yeah. What they're trying to do is slow that down. So they're yeah. saying, hold up. Yeah. We know this thing is changing. We know the annual white death rate in 10 states will, is actually higher than annual uh, white birth rate. But what this is about is. How do we codify this? Right. And that's why they want the Supreme Court to rule. Exactly. But look at look at the you, the browning of America. What is what is fascinating about this in a negative way is how uh, the GOP and 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 other white organizations are systematic in their effort to combat politically, business-wise, economically, socially, combat the browning of America. They, at local level, county level, federal level, everything that they're doing here, pay attention, right, is to either suppress the black vote, suppress people of color's economic ability to, to move ahead, uh, gerrymandering, you name it, because they're trying to hold off on the majority of this country being people of color. Now, the real danger in that for them, and what what they won't ask us about is this, Professor. You know, their fear is rooted in, they believe that if we become the majority, I think, that we are going to treat white Americans the way well, they treated us. And right? that's what they yeah, scared us, Scott. Because exactly. they know what they did to us. That's right. Now, watch <laughs> and I'm still doing. No, Great. No, well, we, uh, hold on, hold on. Go finish. Okay, finish but, watch, but watch this now, right? If you look at our culture of people, that's of right. black people, Never if there's any person or group in America that should be the angriest of all, right. it is black America. Right. And we're the most and yet, sympathetic. And we're the most right. sympathetic. Yeah, we're the most hold sympathetic. On. We want to matriculate. Right. We want to integrate. We want our fair share, well, our right. piece of the pie. Hold Some of y'all want to integrate. A lot of us. <laughs> I always say we got two, two, two decades but, but too early. No point. doubt. We, yeah. Yeah. Back, we didn't have the infrastructure. But they haven't paid yeah. attention. They haven't paid attention I, to what our culture says, which is completely different than their oppressive culture. Greg, that's right. You know, Roland, this is a very, and this might be the most important mm -hmm. topic we're discussing tonight. Um, to tie a couple of things you said, Brother Bennett, together. The local level is very important. This affects mm -hmm. local politics as well in terms of distribution. And when you said that our folks maybe don't understand, you know, we're out there trying to make a living, trying to survive, to listen to what Roland said, to you to walk walk through this, very important. There are 435 seats in the federal legislature, mm -hmm. the Congress. That number doesn't increase. Mm -hmm. So for a state yep, to 435 get... 435 in the House, 100 in the Senate. Exactly. So for a state to get a congressperson, some other state has to lose them. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what they've done is, with this guy, uh, Thomas Hopbelter, and mind you, we wouldn't have even known about this had his daughter not been on the internet looking for him mm -hmm. and found out that he died. She didn't know he died. Mm. She was a strange they were strange. Strange. That's exactly yeah. right. So then she reaches out to her mother mm -hmm. and to, her, to look through for family photographs and stuff. She discovers all these hard drives and then reaches out to this uh, to this nonprofit to say, I'm looking for a lawyer that's not connected to my father because mm -hmm. I'm trying to get this probate stuff done. And, th and then she says, but I did run across these things that might be interesting. And here's where it gets very interesting. This New York billionaire Paul Singer. He was the one that paid for the memo that this guy wrote because the question was, and here was the question, how can we increase our strength in the Republican Party? That's when this guy writes a memo and says, you've got to reduce in the sense, if we see, we got to be able to reduce the number. Mm -hmm. And to reduce the number of, of, of people who we don't want voting, you, you should move from counting just bodies, people who live in these states, and go to counting, this is their strategy, voting age citizens. That's what they want to move to. But guess what? The only 
document in the federal law that was even tracking any number of voting age citizens was the Civil Rights Act of 1965. Yeah. Why was that? Because they wanted to make sure that black folks were being represented in, in the federal legislature. So now they... Voter Rights Act. Voter the Voter Rights Act. Act. Excuse me. Voter Rights Act. Mm -hmm. So then what does Hofstetter say? We got to be able to tie this to voting, rate, voting age citizens, but we don't have any data. Right. The best way to get data would be to put a citizenship question on the census, and that would also serve to scare these people off from, mm -hmm. from answering the census, and that would shrink it. Their real strategy, finally, this is why this lawsuit for the Supreme Court is so important. This is why John Roberts, feckless John Roberts, Justice Gorsuch McConnell, and this Brett Beer Kavanaugh, and this Tom Thomas, this is why this block is so important. When they had oral arguments a couple of weeks ago about the census question, they look like they're buying, they're, they're ready to buy this exact Precisely. opposite thing Precisely. of saying that it's going to help voting when in fact it wouldn't. But here's the real issue. They want to get to the point where they can count voting age citizens. Right. If they start counting voting aid citizens, right. mm -hmm. that means they can now move those seats to those growing majority uh, uh, states, but also reduce the number of non-white people mm -hmm. who are going to participate in the process. And as Roland always says, they want to run this thing for the next 50 years. Which and that's why the why, court is so yeah. important. Which is why you have to understand the lawsuit in Ohio that went to the Supreme Court. White, white guy filed where they are purging people by saying if you have not voted in the last two elections, right. we will automatically remove you from the voting rolls because the next step, Greg, is going to be not just those of voting age, but those who vote. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is why, which I told y'all what happened in Florida. Oh, One of the reasons Andrew Gillum lost, because white folks in Upper Florida who are senior citizens voted at higher rates than you did black folks and brown folks in Miami-Dade County and Broward. Understand this, okay? So let me just say this before I go to my next story. This is why y'all ain't getting this on CNN. No. <laughs> You're not getting this on MSNBC. You're not getting it on Fox News. That's right. Because you have to understand what Republicans <laughs> are doing. They are specifically going through and saying, okay, we have to figure out legal ways to mm -hmm. restrict mm -hmm. right. voting. The guy who died, he was their top expert on gerrymandering. That's mm -hmm. right. Oh, y'all might say, okay, gerrymandering. Yes. Remember the Wisconsin case when the Supreme Court kicked it back? There are two gerrymandering cases right now before the Supreme Court. One from Maryland involving Democrats in one district, but the other involving North Carolina. Exactly. You also have the Pennsylvania case in gerrymandering. If this conservative Supreme Court rules that gerrymandering is allowed, every state will create gerrymandering. That's why in some states, Democrats can win 55% of the vote. That's right. But then they don't win the majority of the seats nope. because of gerrymandering. All of these things are linked, and all of these things go back to the highest court in the land. Supreme Court deciding this, which is why they refused to have Merrick Garland even have a hearing, which is why I'm still upset that Obama didn't nominate a black woman to right. the Supreme Court because he wanted to play fair. They don't play fair. Just had Mitch McConnell say, oh, of yeah. course, <laughs> if there's an opening next year in the presidential oh. year, we are, going to con we are going to have hearings. Mm. But he said something differently in 2016. Y'all need to understand all you Negroes out there who are saying elections don't matter, these things, don't, uh, no big deal. The Supreme Court and the federal judiciary is the most important thing Republicans want to control. That's right. Because that's who determines what laws are constitutional. And what are they loading up on? Unconstitutional. That's right. That's what's going on. <laughs> and so that's why Democrats, y'all better be running strong folks for the United States Senate next mm -hmm. year. Because if you do not take control of the U.S. Senate, the Republicans will control those seats. The only thing is if Republicans maintain control of the Senate and the Democrat is the president, the president is going to be actually making the appointments for the federal bench, then you're going to have the fight. All these things are connected, so you better understand uh, what's going on. That's right. Speaking of that, Bob Mueller, of course, has ticked off Donald Trump and his people when he came out yesterday <laughs> and spoke about uh, his report. Now, he didn't say anything new, but this is what actually changed the game. By him speaking and by him countering what Barr said, the attorney general, he is forced the conversation to back to the report, the one that people didn't read. Press play. Now, I have not spoken publicly during our investigation. I'm speaking out today because our investigation is complete. The Attorney General has made the report on our investigation largely public. We are formally closing the special counsel's office, and as well, I'm resigning 
uh, from the Department of Justice to return to private life. And as set forth in the report, after that investigation, if we had had co confidence that the President clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the President did commit a crime. It explains that under long-standing Department policy, a pres President cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. That is unconstitutional. Even if the charge is kept under seal and hidden from public view, that too is prohibited. The Special Counsel's Office is part of the Department of Justice, and by regulation, it was bound by that Department policy. Charging the President with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. All right, I got to deal with this, y'all, okay? I got to, because this is really, like, pissing me off. It just really, it's really ticking me off. I'm sorry. At last I checked, I mean, I've read the Constitution. There is no, nothing, there's nowhere in the United States Constitution that says a president cannot be indicted. Nowhere. You can't find it. What he's talking about, Scott, is a memo right. that was written by the Nixon Department of Justice <laughs> in order to ensure Nixon right. didn't get indicted. Come right. on. And right. all of these people <laughs> are acting as if this is like manna from heaven, <laughs> like God told Moses, Ooh. here are the two tablets, <laughs> and you can't die the president. It's a bullshit memo. Right, right. I wish we had it for written, some written by, people. Written by, written by right. Nixon, <laughs> Nixon supporters. Well, remember who, who ended up the attorney general in that Nixon uh, justice Which department. one he fired to? No, three. I'm talking about the one who said he would do whatever Nixon wanted. Robert Bork. Well, well, no, at, no. William Rehnquist went over there, and Bork was over there, and you know John Roberts clerked for William Rehnquist. You see, these think, these people think generationally, but let's think about this for a second. It's very important what you just raised. Mueller believes in America, to a fault. I think what Mueller is saying, basically, what he's maybe afraid of is, if he indicts the president of the United States, now you've thrown this country into chaos. He's, he don't want to set no precedent. It's already in right. chaos. Well, well, it's already in precedent. Well, no, no, but, 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 but here's, the, but, but here's my problem yeah, yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying? But here's no my precedent. problem with that. And that's what that nonsense Nancy Pelosi is saying. Yeah. Right. But the Constitution oh. clearly lays out yes. high crimes and misdemeanors. Yes. The right. Constitution has created a provision yep. and a president can be removed. Right. And my problem is these people in D.C., have walking around like, oh, no, no, you can't, you can't, no, you can't touch the president. I mean, and that's why when Trump came in, mm -hmm. he was like, oh, hell, I can do what I want to do. Can't yeah, but this. it's a political, you know, the, the, the reason the memo lives, remember, it lives in DOJ. It's never been challenged. And so right. it ought never to be been cha challenged. Never been challenged. It should it's be put law. in the shredder. It's policy. It's not law, okay? So, so, one, that's never been challenged. Two, they extrapolate other parts of the Constitution and say the impeachment, which is a political process, uh, is what you do with the president and if it's a federal crime because they say high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, that may be true. But no one is above the law. And the reason that is unsettling is because if Donald Trump shot somebody or set somebody on fire on the lawn like that, that gentleman did yesterday, yes. and we all observed it on video, are you saying that the president couldn't be charged? Yes. No. If Mueller is absolutely right about this, and I think he punted because he could have challenged all of this, if he's right, then there is one person above the law. And impeachment isn't a crime. Impeachment means you get removed from office. But that begs the question, well, what if I do commit a crime? I can just walk away. Well, that's nonsense. Or do I have to be charged by the state if I kill somebody this, while and, I'm in office? And, and this is the thing that Martellus is driving me crazy. It's because literally what they are saying is that, yes, everybody in America, mm -hmm. except the president, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can get charged. And that's what you're left Spirity with. Spirity Agnew yeah, right. was vice president that's under true. Nixon. That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got charged. Yeah, tax evasion. What? Had to resign. At the That's state right. level, though. Yeah, yeah but no, no, I got you. But he the vice president. Yep. Right. They are making the argument that, oh, no, president is just totally All untouchable. Yeah. He can do what the hell he wants because the, the logic was he would be too busy mm -hmm. being president if he got charged. No, wrongdoing is wrongdoing. 
Yeah, I think the other thing now that changes too is I think everyone, we're in a display culture, so everyone worries about how things look and not how things are, you know? So I feel like they feel like it's a reflection on America, how it's look, because now more people can see what's going on in America. Mm -hmm. So they feel like, hey, if we do this, then Russia sees us, this place sees us, everyone can see that we're in turmoil right now. So I think they kind of move from a point, but I don't think there are any moral victories in politics. <laughs> not, not at all, but but, the, yeah, but Pelosi's like problem, a moral move, hold on yeah, guys, Pelosi's yeah, like, problem, yeah, it may be a political actually. process, yeah, yeah, he has but she is right. politicizing yeah. whether to move for impeachment or not because he, she knows that he won't be impeached in the Senate. But there's a moral, political, and legal obligation, right. constitutional obligation for the Democrats in the House to do their job. Not, what, Mueller what, almost he, put that, he, Mueller put that Back on the Congress, he said there sure is an did. alternative piece. But, sure but, 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 and by but, the but, way, he could have gone further and said, but for this memo, I would have charged or he could have been charged with obstruction. Sure. Because then that would have added more pressure. He decided to punt on that. But even even he didn't come strong enough. He said obstruction. He gave you 10 examples. And he said, now, Congress, go do your thing. But his was and now you got the to house the first not But, but yeah. Teresa, his was right. interesting. Right. The Ken right. Starr. That's right. Ken Starr was an independent investigator. He had a memo. Mm -hmm. And his memo, here we go to my iPad. This is from a July 22nd, 2017 story in the New York Times. The 56-page memo locked in the National Archives for nearly two decades and obtained by the New York Times under the Freedom of Information Act um, says this, quote, it is proper, constitutional, and legal for a federal grand jury to indict a sitting president for serious criminal acts that are not part of and are contrary to the president's official duties. In this country, no one, even President Clinton, is above the law. Right. Mm -hmm. Our problem is... Mueller gets up there and says, oh, well, this memo from 1973, this is it. This, deal, this, this is DOJ. Uh, they're, but pe this also is a memo. And the problem here is that impeachment is not supposed to be nice. Right. Impeachment, or easy. Impeachment it should tear apart the country. It should be Because it is the highest to say that we, we are going to initiate impeachment proceedings against the president of the United States. And then enlist the Democrats. And I get, I hear Pelosi, but here's this whole problem I have. Well, there's no sense in us doing this because the Senate is controlled by Republicans, and so therefore, you know, they're never going to convict him. Richard Nixon was never con was never impeached by the House. There were impeachment hearings. Mm -hmm. The hearings were so destructive right. mm -hmm. that they said, "Player Howard Baker, the long walk up right. uh, the driveway, right. Mr. President, time for your ass to go," because if this continues, we will be forced to vote to impeach you. Nixon resigned before mm -hmm. there was even a vote. Right. right. I hear Pelosi's point, but I'm like, what are you talking about? So what? The hearings allows the public to actually listen to what's in the report. Right. We deserve and that. And listen to witnesses. Ideally. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Yeah. It was in the low 30s. Mm -hmm. Approval ratings, the, the numbers to impeach Nixon. By the time they got through those hearings, it was above 50 plus percent because the public was like, he did what? And he did what? And he did what? <laughs> oh yeah, he gotta go. And that's why, yeah. and, and so, yeah. and, and again, so to listen to them, because what the Democrats are trying to do is, if we could just wait for the election, that's what Obama did in 2016. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't release the report on Russia. Uh, and God. I think, you know, uh, kind of just, I think everybody's waiting for the process, I, and, I, and I don't think... How do you wait for the process when the, you are the process? You are or the you process, but the nobody process. wants to be the first one to start that process. But, that, but no, but, why not? Back, but here's the problem. Back. When you were sworn in, right. you were sworn to protect and uphold the Constitution from enemies, enemies foreign and domestic. Mm -hmm. As Elizabeth Warren said on The View, I was sworn in to uphold the Constitution. Not Democrat, not Republican, right. not Trump, not Obama, the Constitution, right. and that's the, and that's why you have just you have Representative Amash, Republican from of uh, Michigan, who is taking heat by saying, "I'm sorry, I read the report. This man committed obstruction of justice." And so that's what they're fearful of. If more individuals are re more elected, because I, I doubt that most of the the city they don't know they haven't read it. Hasn't no, read. They, they barely read the four page memo. Oh, yeah. So if more people start to read it, if it goes more out into the, I mean, it is out there. I'm actually on page 300. So. If more of it is out there, and I think the, the process of the hearings actually start to take place, then right. yes, the proceedings will happen. And they're mad, Martellus, because by him coming out, basically saying, y'all ain't read my damn report, I'm trying to tell you to read it, 
he is now <laughs> forcing a, another conversation because Barr tried to play everybody. Right. Yeah. Barr tried to shade it. Mom. Now, you can't shade it when Mueller says, if we were convinced that he did not commit a crime, we would have said so. Yeah. As him saying, his ass committed a crime. Go. <laughs> yeah, I think that the whole thing is that in a democracy, the people deserve to have the information to make the decisions that need to be made. So right now, it's a, it's a, it's a deprivation of information, which if we don't have information and people aren't reading these things, they should be able to sit and listen to the conversation happening in real time. So therefore, they can make the people as a large can make the decision that needs to be made. But now by not going to hearing, by not charging them, we don't get a chance to have access to information in a digestible way for the majority of the population to be able to understand what's happening. Because not too many people, people don't even read books. So you can't expect them to pick up the Mueller report and go read that and really... Right. They'll watch TV. Well, I yeah. right. you can get oh, First of all, let me... They'll watch, let me uh, they'll watch the hearings. <laughs> right, precisely. That's yeah, the key. Uh, Henry, go to my iPad real quick. <laughs> Shout out to Latoya Alter. Uh, she contributed a buck ninety nine. Hey, no, 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 the iPad, the iPad, mm -hmm. the iPad. She contributed a buck ninety nine to the show. She said, "This is impeachment dollars." She got two on it. <laughs> no, she said, I put. She said, "I put two on it." Uh, and so, if y'all, you know, y'all can give to the show on no the question. YouTube channel, no, no so y'all can do that. No question. For your fan club because of the impeachment. Hey, no, but no, but no, but the sister. What you keep saying, keep saying, Roland? What you keep saying by explaining these things in ways people can grasp them now. And then, Teresa, I'm glad you said that, because when you begin to read the report, which is for sale for dirt cheap all over the country, you can free. get it online. For right? free. For free. Free you PDF, right? <laughs> you, what you read is what he has done. But, I mean, again, Marcel, I think the point you're raising, brother, our people are not reading. Mm -hmm. This People in this country are not reading. And, no. and so what Pelosi realizes is this electorate is going, the people going to back Trump are going to back Trump. Now, check yeah. this out, y'all. Of course, uh, Donald Trump was tweeting today. You know, he was lying as usual. I kept denying Russia helped him, but then guess what? His little sticky fat fingers all of a sudden said what the truth was. This is what he tweeted this morning. Russia, Russia, Russia. That's uh, all you heard at the beginning of this witch hunt hoax. And now Russia has disappeared because I had nothing to do with Russia helping me get elected. Oh. Ah! <laughs> it was it was a crime that didn't exist, so now the Dems and their partner, the fake news media, blah, blah, blah. But then he tried to backtrack, y'all, so then he tried to send this tweet out. Actually, no. He, first of all, sent, deleted the tweet, tried to send another one. Then he realized, well, damn, that really didn't do the trick. So, <laughs> so then he decided to hop in front of the cameras. Watch this. No, Russia did not help me get elected. You know who got me elected? You know who got me elected? I got me elected. Russia didn't help me at all. Russia, if anything, I think helped the other side. What you ought to ask is this. Do you think the media helped Hillary Clinton get elected? She didn't make it. But you take a look at collusion between Hillary Clinton and the media. You take a look at collusion between Hillary Clinton and Russia. She had more to do in the campaign with Russia than I did. I had nothing to do. And by the way, that's one other thing. When you look, this is all about Russia, Russia, Russia. They don't talk about Russia anymore because it turned out to be a hoax. It was all a hoax. But your little fat finger says something different. Sure. Bottom line is, you're lying. You're lying. Mueller yesterday said a foreign country tried to, it did in fact interfere with our election. Mm -hmm. We know for a fact that Russian hackers access uh, the uh, voting records of two counties in Florida. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they won't tell us what those counties are. Mm -hmm. We know for a mm -hmm. fact that he and his cohorts, his campaign, they were trying to meet to get dirt on Hillary Clinton. You are a liar. You're an orange liar, but you're a liar. And then go to accept it. That's why we, every time he lies, y'all, we will use hashtag Trump lies Mary. Now, speaking of lying, there's nobody who has lied more to help Donald Trump than Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. In fact, he has absolutely embarrassed himself. He should never call himself a friend of Senator John McCain again because what he has done 
uh, to suck up to Donald Trump is actually shocking, stunning, and pretty pathetic. And the person who says it's time for him to go is Jamie Harrison. Jamie, a top official in the Democratic National Committee, uh, he joins us right now. He announced that he is running for the United States Senate in South Carolina. Um, Jamie, you got an uphill battle, of course. You're in a red state. A lot of black folks, but you still got a lot of white folks who wave their Confederate flags. Uh, Lindsey Graham, of course, has been reelected several different times. What will it take for you to beat Lindsey Graham in South Carolina? Yeah, you know, Roland, I, I tell people this whole red state, blue state stuff is, is an excuse. I mean, think about Maryland, think about Massachusetts, think about Maine. Those are quote unquote blue states, but what do they have in common? They have a re Republican governors. So the Republicans don't cede anything to us, so why the hell should we cede anything to them? We are going to fight, and we're going to give Lindsey Graham the fight of his life because we're going to start talking to the people. You know, we can spend all day talking about Lindsey, but it's, you know, Lindsey is just part of the problem. Uh, there, these people in South Carolina are going through something on a day-to-day -day basis. I was just in Denmark, South Carolina this weekend handing out uh, – just bottles, hundreds of bottles of water to people because uh, the government, the local town, had been putting chemicals in the water for 10 years, uh, chemicals that the EPA said that they shouldn't have put in there. And so do you think Lindsay stepped into that town? Did, did he make a phone call? Did he go there? It's a predominantly African-American uh, little town. He didn't. He didn't lift a finger. Uh, so these folks need someone who will go in and fight for them. And that's, that's what I want to do. That's who I am. That's what I've done my entire life. And that's what I'll do as the United States Senate. You also have a guy, you, know you also have a guy right now who, who, uh, who we have re video of him talking about impeachment, talking about high crimes and misdemeanors. Now he's saying that Democrats let a rectal exam of Donald Trump and that Mueller should move on and so should we. Hmm. I mean, did he kind of forget what he had to say? Does he have dementia? Does he like have Alzheimer's? Well, well, Roland, I don't know if you, you've seen my video. We kind of highlight some of uh, the back and forth between what I call Lindsay 1.0 and Lindsay 2.0. Uh, you know, and the Lindsay 2.0 is, is in essence a overpaid uh, a golf caddy. I mean, this is a guy who, who will say any and everything because he believes that he needs to touch the emperor's role in order to have power. Uh, the sad part is that he doesn't use any of that power to benefit the people of South Carolina. Um, again, uh, it's going to be a, a huge race. You got to raise a lot of money. Uh, you got to go across that particular state. I'll ask you this. I asked Bernie Sanders a question. This is the last question. Are you going to yeah. go look broke white folks in the eye in South Carolina and say, your education is bad, your health care is bad? Why are you going to vote for a guy who wants to get rid of the very health care that's actually saving your life? Yeah. I am. And you know what I'm going to do, Roland? So in, in South Carolina, four rural hospitals have closed. And it's because the Republicans refuse to allow Medicaid expansion. Lindsey Graham has his health care bill, Graham Cassidy, uh, that he made up in the barber shop with Rick Santorum somewhere in Washington, D.C. But what this means in these communities is that if you have complications with diabetes, you have a stroke or you have a heart attack, doesn't matter if you're black, white, Latino. Doesn't matter if you voted for Donald Trump or you voted for Hillary Clinton. It's a matter of life and death. And so, in in, in the cause of it is the Republicans who refuse to allow this health care uh, uh, health care to happen in these communities. I'm going to fight tooth and nail, and I'm going to educate the people of South Carolina because that has not happened here in well over a decade about what these guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis to, to, to uh, take their taxpayer dollars and, and give it to other states. All right, folks. JB right. Harrison, good luck. We appreciate it and uh, look forward Thank to having you, you back. I appreciate you. All right, thanks so much. Thank you, man. All right, folks, got to go to a break right now. We come back at Roland Martin Unfiltered. We'll talk with Martellus about uh, his new book. All of that, Roland Martin Unfiltered, back in a moment. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. 
Hey guys, they're back. MarijuanaStock.org has another great investment opportunity. If you were lucky enough to invest in their last crowdfunding campaign, you know they raise a lot of money in just a few months investing in legal marijuana farms. Those additional investors now own shares of a publicly traded company. They're on fire. Now, of course, many of you missed it the first time. Now you have a second shot. They have a new investment opportunity that is as good or if not better than the last time. I'm talking about industrial hemp CBD. For those who don't know, the hemp plant is the cousin to marijuana with a much higher concentration of CBD, which means hemp CBD gives you all of the medical benefits of marijuana without getting you hot. Until recently, hemp farming was practically illegal in the United States and heavily regulated by the DEA. However, the 2018 Farm Bill recently passed in Congress, making it legal to grow hemp CBD in the U.S. and creating one of the largest commodities worldwide. They need land to grow all of the plants. This makes for an incredible investment opportunity, and that's where our good friends at 420 Real Estate come in. Their business model is simple. They buy land that supports hemp CBD grow operations and lease it to licensed hemp paying tenants. Now, that's right, they are hemp CBD landlords and you can get in on the action. You can invest in this crowdfunding campaign for as little as 200 bucks up to $10,000. Like I said, you don't wanna miss out. You should certainly join the folks who are investing. You can go to marijuanastock.org, marijuanastock.org uh, to get in the game and you should do it now. All right, folks, let's talk about a uh, book written by Martellus Bennett, who's on our panel here. Uh, it's a book, it's a letter of encouragement to all the brown skinned boys around the world mm. who feel like sports are all that they have. He believes that the things that make these boys great on whatever playing surface they choose will make them great in life. And so let's talk about his book right now with Martellus. So first of all, where did the book idea come from? Well, I originally wrote this poem watching the Alton Sterling incident. Um, I didn't really, like, usually when I get lost for words, I usually turn to my art. Like, whether it's painting, I paint those moments, so I kind of paint the way I feel to, trans to translate, to communicate with the world what I'm going through. So I wrote this poem originally then because when I see Alton Sterling, I saw myself. So my brother, that could be any of us, and I think that's a big thing about this world. For us, when we see things happening to black people, we realize that could be any one of us and anyone that we know. When the rest of the world sees that, they'd be like, oh, that's not you, you don't live there, or that couldn't be you in those situations. So that's when the initial, that's why I wrote the original poem. And it went, a lot of people loved it, and I put it online, and people were reading it to their kids, and I'm an experienced guy. I write children's book because I like to create moments for families to come together, because a children's book, you just don't head it to your little kid and be like, hey, go read this, and come back and give me a book report. You sit down and you read it to them, bedtime stories, or whenever you want to read. So I like to create those moments, but mainly, like, in my company, I focus on creating escapism for black kids, because I think escapism is one of the things that we miss out on the most, because when you get to visit other worlds, fictitious worlds that were built, you come back a little change and realize your world doesn't have to be the way that it is. And we don't really get to experience escapism. We don't get Star Wars. We don't get Hogwarts. We don't get all these other places that exist in the world. So uh, that's how I come out make these things. But dear black boy, to make a um, dear black boy, I believe that like the children are the landscapers of our tomorrow. Yes, sir. Um, so for me, I try to pave the way I want the world. I want to shape the world, what the world's going to be like that my daughter's going to live in in the future. So a lot of the times when I'm working with kids and kids who look like me, look like her dad, and things like that so that she could see, I could see the change happening as I go. So um, I felt like as a black man, as you probably, people probably ask you, what sport do you play when they meet you? They don't really ask you what you're interested in and what you're doing or who Which you are. Which pisses me off! <laughs> <laughs> How many professional Which athletes do they ask? So what else are you into? Are you into painting and writing? Uh, and painting? When last time somebody asked you about right. your painting, right. brother, your right. art? Right. No, one, no one ever asked me uh, about those <laughs> things, right? Really, because I never saw myself as an athlete. I saw myself as a creative oh. who had athletic ability, mm -hmm. Critical. right? So I get, I get mad when someone refers to me as a former NFL player because I've done stuff for Disney. I've been on Forbes 30 under 30. I've been at week's top 100 creators in the Come world. Mm -hmm. I've did TED Talks. There's so many other things that I'm a former of that you could mention <laughs> that has nothing to do with the sport. Mm -hmm. And I feel like they value the black boy as an athlete in the world. So the black boy starts to see value in himself yeah. by the way they perform mm -hmm. on the field. Mm -hmm. But what I try to get them to understand is that currency of athleticism is only valuable on the court on a sport. On a, on, a, on a field, but once that game is over, being able to jump high does not matter in the tech industry. Right. Being able to run fast does not matter in the <laughs> hospital. Well, it does kind of matter in the hospital because you can run to patients faster. <laughs> but like, you got to be able to do something once you get there. <laughs> like, right. So for me, like, that value in the world, the black boy, the world is more beautiful when the black boy dreams. And right, and a black boy deserves the space to dream the dreams that they want to dream. No longer should we have to feel like they have to roll them a ball and say, good luck. 
right? Mm -hmm. Everything is on the table. Everything is an option. Every opportunity exists for you. And it's hard because you don't see yourself represented in these different fields. Like, we talk about politics. Mm -hmm. No black kid, they, they could run in and all these things. Like, we try to break in. Like, there's so many firsts happening for black people. And we've been in this just as long as everyone else. Your first in 2019. Yes. Does it, so I got, so I'll throw this out. Okay. So how long has the book been out? <laughs> this book has been out since I released it March, March 27th. March 27th. I think. No, that's when I retired. How I many? <laughs> <laughs> one, but, but, you yeah. talk, but when you retire, you talk about the comfort that you wanted to create in things that you're doing. How many mainstream TV networks have you been on? I've been on a lot. Yeah. Have you been on MSNBC? I was on there with, um, is that where Al Sharpton is on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was on yeah. there. The CNN? Day. Yeah, I was on Fox there with, News? with Don. With Don. Yeah. See, he ain't know nobody's not black yet. ABC, <laughs> NBC, CBS. See, the thing, see, the, thing the, reason, so the reason I'm saying that is because you're absolutely right in terms of how uh, the, 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 the narrative that is shaped. So the reason I say it, 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 and it really does piss me off. When people see me wearing Texas A&M stuff, yeah, and they go, uh, "Did you play ball?" Yeah, and then I'm like, "No." Then the second question is, "Are you a coach?" Yeah. Then the third question <laughs> is, "Are you a fan?" Yeah. I'm like, "When are you gonna get to the graduate part?" Right. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and it really does piss me off because, and, and what people, other people will say, "Man, why you get all upset?" I'm like, because what you're doing is you're saying that the only way you could have gone right to a Texas A&M is if you played football. The broader point, which I think the point that you're making, mm -hmm. is that this world has to see us as more than just uh, mandingos. Yes, hmm. gladiators, entertainers. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you look at a black boy, you should see a dreamer, you should see a, riot, a writer, you should see a scientist, you should see every possible thing in the world. So when you see a black boy, you shouldn't assume that they play sports. You should be like, hey, what, what are you guys interested in? Right there. What, right. what, what do you like? Okay, right. but in all fairness, let me let me just conceptually push back. Right? Okay. You're an incredible athlete. Your brother is. They see you on TV. You chose to play football. You chose to play Folks, you don't know his brother's Michael Bennett. Absolutely. Also Michael Texas Bennett. A&M graduate. Right. And plays now. So, He's so a you were coach. willing... Yeah. So you are a willing prisoner of that athletic and NFL culture, and yet you do other things. I was not Aren't a prisoner. You, hold on, hold on. Aren't you asking the public to uh, a little more to be more difficult and to go deeper into you when all they know, just from a big picture standpoint and PR standpoint, is you as a football player? No, I am not because I was never like I am not a football player. I play football. That's not who I am. That's one thing mm. I do. That's, that's something. That's something What's I the did. But it's a whole identity thing. Like, when they tie my identity to a sport, I have an issue with it because that's not who I am. That's something I did. Mm -hmm. And when they tie your identity... But that's how they no, know No, 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 but wait, but wait. No, they, but they, and they well, that's how the fans know you. But here's the thing, Well, they know you as a football but, player. But I give them so many other opportunities to introduce them to other things that I do in the world. I have okay. been creating and making things. Mm -hmm. Someone had to teach me how to play sports. Mm -hmm. No one had to teach me how to make things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right? So, like, for me, what I'm saying is, it's not the... Playing sports is not a bad thing. It was my but side But that's hustle. where your most exposure is, It was my side hustle. They're not exposed. You know, you know, no, 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 yeah, so, so football, that, so let me tell you, so football okay. was my side hustle, okay. right? I used it as an opportunity to get to where I wanted to build, Come on, man. right? So the, the, the fact is that I was never really a football player. I'm not a football guy. It's something I had to do to get to where I wanted to be. Hmm. I understood that from the get-go, right? Hmm. So when I wanted to go to school, what I wanted to do, I used it. The, the problem is most kids don't use the sport. The sport uses them. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they get nothing out of the sport. Mm -hmm. And there's a form of PTSD that happens mm -hmm. when guys retire from the NFL or whatever sport they is because they lost their identity when their parents wow. signed a waiver for them wow. to play in PTSD. Wee football. Wow. So the whole thing of what I'm telling is the grooming full human beings who are more than just athletes because that's just something that they do. But if I agree, right? with but, but what you, it also does with you. Oh, hold on one second. I agree. I agree with all of that, right? But at the same time, isn't it unfair to criticize others who see you as an athlete and, a, and an NFL football player because that's their greatest exposure? But they that's would what assume, you're known for. The problem is they would assume I played in the NFL even if I didn't play in the NFL. Boom. Because oh. I'm six oh. ah. black Boom. 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 Right. The there dialogue. you go. No, no, you're not. No, no, no you're not. No, no you're not. I was waiting for that. No, no. Hey, 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 Roland, I watch this. Scott, just football? cause nobody that's ever asked you did you play ball, don't mean that they don't ask the rest. No, they don't. No, they don't. Hell no. Hey, but look, no, no, no. But, but, but this, this, this is my agent. agent. But look, this is they, they asked you if your ass was a trainer. <laughs> they ain't asked you if you were a damn player. Right, right, right. But let, let me say this to you, brother, because I think it's very important for us to understand. What you're doing now is finding your way into inventing something that we didn't need before this generation. This is really a result, we're talking about Scott, mm -hmm. of the post desegregation era. 
Because if you think about, let's go back even to Paul Robeson, or before mm -hmm. that to Major Taylor and these cats. Mm -hmm. If you were an athlete in our community, you were in black institutions, which means you were also good in athletics, mm -hmm. but you were also good in academics. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these cats went out and, and built companies and became lawyers and doctors. Right. After 1960, the 60s, where you see desegregation, when they began to cherry pick black athletes and put them in these white schools, mm -hmm. the thing got inverted. So this hey. generation now, what we're saying you have much more in common with a Bill Russell or a Paul Robeson yes. or, you know, or an Althea uh, Gibson, yes, who was like but that, than you do. But, but, but what happened is now, I can agree and, with you. No, 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 the thing is, like, when you limit a black boy to just thinking that sports is the only escape, right? right? Mm -hmm. There's so many kids who became doctors and lawyers this weekend that never got put on a pedestal, mm -hmm. right? But the NFL, you see the draft, you that's see these right. kids. That's so right. you see you see people that you can relate to that make you believe, like, that's the thing that you could do. But once you don't see the doctors, you don't see the, the mm -hmm. film directors, exactly. you don't see that stuff, but those people exist. That's right. But they have to be... And, have to, and, well, why and, and, and wait, but wait, but, and, and here's why. No, here's when why. No, no, here's why, Scott. Here's but why. You stop yelling. No, here's why. Because you're not listening. Here's I'm why. Listening. I can't here's hear why. Because you're because, here's why. Because when they do that, mm -hmm. the problem is, to your point, when they see the person who is six seven who didn't play ball, right. they have now they have now associated six seven and 250, 260, 270, two fifty, two sixty, two seventy, two thirty with male. oh you play ball. Right. What you're saying is no, y'all gonna look at me for me. Ask me what you do, which is the point I am making. So I don't want to hear somebody say, oh, Roland, uh, you're built like a uh, running back. I didn't play goddamn football. <laughs> right. yeah, okay? Right. Never played football. But, but let me, let me, so don't tell me I'm built like somebody but, 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 when I'm not. Roland was a dude yeah, who, when, my, when Yates High School won a state championship, my ass was in the press box videotaping the game because yeah. I was at the Magnus School of Communications. Right. I wasn't there to play ball. And if we don't push back on that, that means that when teachers see a boy That's who is six foot tall mm -hmm. in the eighth grade, they're going to say, why don't you play ball? Why don't you play ball? Yeah. Unlike we had a brother who played football at Texas A&M mm -hmm. who was not playing on an athletic scholarship. He was there on an academic scholarship because he was there to be an architect. And the coaches used to get pissed because <laughs> why are you late? Because it's an architecture project. But that's the issue, too, because now when black boys go to colleges, they go to these major universities, they push and discourage to take that's what on that's majors right. that take you away from the game. That's right. This has come to a problem of not bringing right. a whole human being. Like, they say, they what they usually do is say, um, they'll say, school first, Football second. No right. question. You see what I did right there? Uh, right. Right. School first, football, football second. Right. Hold on, hold on. Hold right. on. Put That's the right. camera on my camera. Yeah. Yeah. Put the camera. School first, football second. That's what they do. That's how they tell you. They show it to you. The whole right. idea is that when guys go to school, they they every guy, every player, every black kid thinks that they're gonna make it to the NFL. They're not. There's only fifteen hundred guys in the NFL. Oh, brother. Mm -hmm. Fifteen hundred. There's a hundred thousand people. In the history, it, the but, number but, is even skewed. Right, no, but the point is compared to only every year. Right. I mean, every year, like, exactly. Yeah, right. and, see, and, what, and what I have been trying to do, so you take, uh, you take as a brother uh, uh, right now. Folks ain't ever even heard of this brother. Y'all, you heard of uh, uh, who's the NBA commissioner? Al Silver. 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 Adam Silver. Adam Silver. Yeah. Are oh, you talking about the young cat that's who's going the, to Australia? Uh, who's the number two? Oh wow. Oh, it's a brother. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You really. I, you really gonna get your stuff revoked? Hold on, no, he a kappa. He is. You're right. Mm. You, don't I, I you don't even know. You don't even know. You don't see his face. I do see his face. <laughs> you don't even see his face. That's what they do. So here's my name. His name is Mark Tatum. That's it. Yeah, so, Mark yeah. Tatum. Of course, of course that's it. Mark I'm telling you, that's who it is. So, so here's the point that I keep making. Here's the point that I keep making. Brothers, if y'all want to be in the NBA, be Mark Tatum. Oh, no question. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility. The whole thing right. is... But, but, Teresa, yeah. if I never yeah. see a Mark right. Tatum, right. and I only see LeBron, and I only see Steph, well, then I'm going to be LeBron and Steph, versus Mark Tatum going to be there for about 30 years, and he's going to make a and hell of a whole lot of money, and, maybe and he ain't bounce one basketball. I think always it's, it's, it's the quick fix that they teach um, young boys. Like, my nephew's 13 now, and, you know, and he's quite tall for to be in seventh grade. So, uh, you know, he... He goes to all white school, and mostly they was like, "Hey, you mm. should probably go um, play basketball <laughs> or football, mm. right?" And and the guy gets oh. 
both, <laughs> and he gets straight A's. And okay. I said, and and and, but then I, I remember one time he pulled out his phone in class, and it was just, oh, let's just sound the alarm. You know, we might have a problem here. So wh which is it? So now he might have a behavior problem because so this, you know. Here's the thing. When I came out of high school, I was the number one basketball player and the number one football player in Texas. I was in the NBA draft in high school. I was an honor roll student. I, I, I was one of the smartest kids in the school. Mm -hmm. The thing is, what happens is when you, you have a kid lean on that sports, they, there has to be this intersection where it's, it's okay to be intellectual and athletic. Right. right. But now, they, when you're athletic, they, they push you away from being intellectual and try to groom you to be the athlete oh, it's because it's the number one way that we Precisely. think of escaping. Yeah. And, and that's right. And then they cut off. Any information about the ones that do what you do, which is a maroon, you run and do this other thing. Uh, two quick examples. I, I had a lot of these young people at Ohio State when I was teaching out there as, as a graduate student. Robert Smith. Robert Smith went Robert to medical Smith. school. Right. You can't believe how the Ohio yeah. State football, they went ballistic. Went this guy's a baby. What are you doing? Went nuts. And, you know, and, <laughs> and retired early That's right. from, the, from the Minnesota Vikings, that's and right. they were mad as hell. Mad as hell. And he said, uh, I like my brain. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it come down to. But like, at a young age, you don't really worry about your brain. No, right. I'm gonna get paid millions of dollars. The money. Right. money. When you start having a family and you have other people to yeah. care about, then you'd be like, oh shit, you know, maybe I should be. <laughs> my parents, my <laughs> wife, and my daughter deserves a functional husband, yeah. right. Right. right? Like in the long term of things. Well, so. well let me ask okay. you, how, how, quick, you how, last how, question. How, how you deal, how you influence the others around you? Because the other example I was gonna give is the sister. Hold on. Oh, Scott, you want a question now, but you don't want to tell me you gotta leave at 7 o'clock. Well, it's 7.03. <laughs> I'm late. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you out. Now you want to ask the question. Okay, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Greg, it's my turn. Don't get Greg. It's my turn. Claudrina Harold, who's the chair of history at, at the University of Virginia right now, she was an All Atlantic Ten basketball player at Temple University. She's one of my students, and I was there. She influenced the other young women on that ball team to yeah. take academics seriously. She got a PhD. She's teaching at Virginia. What has been your experience in the locker rooms with these other brothers who look at you and say, yo, man, maybe I need to, hey, must, you, you got something for me to read? Or, I mean, I, I, do you see this? Like a David West in the NBA. Oh, well, David West, for sure, my man, David well, West. Here's, here's yeah. the thing is, I, the one thing I learned about the, the NFL and players who come into the league is a gap of information, yeah, right? They yeah. come into a league and they don't study there. They don't pick up books. So when they go back into the real world, they have no, the, right. the level of education has grown so far and they left behind on what they knew in 2010. They retire in 2016. Then it's like all there. So like I hand a guy a book, they won't read it. They don't like there's they have no thirst. They never had a thirst for knowledge. Right. No, very few of them were actually by like, design. So, mm -hmm. so let me ask you they this. They don't want smart, oh, they what? don't want intelligent people. Oh. They want intelligent football players. Yeah. So when they say a guy's smart, yeah. they're talking about his football, football IQ. IQ. Yeah. Not yeah. his, <laughs> not his <laughs> intellectual which is IQ. Why, right, yes, right. Which is why Rosen, when he was in Arizona, mm -hmm. one of the criticisms, even though he white, it was like, um, <laughs> he's he, he he's too smart. Right. That's what knock on me. Throughout the NFL, really, mm -hmm. I was a smart guy, and I was like I was too smart. I had a coach. I had a coach tell me before a team meeting, come in and say, like, "Hey, Martellus, I'm gonna make some mistakes today. Can you like hold your questions or anything?" Oh no! Oh, wow. Wait a minute. He didn't want you to so, shame him in the so, meeting because it's not missed. shame. It's about getting the right information. No, right. Right. <laughs> right. I don't. I, right. I'm not if y'all lose, it's right. gonna be a fool. I don't think <laughs> about it in a way of right. like combating right. and having a rebuttal. It's like wow. no coach. I'm a note taker, right. and I learned to be a note taker because oh. I was playing for the New York Giants, come and our offensive coordinator was. Kevin Gilbride, and he used to chew your ass out if you mess up, right? So we had this one play, and Eli like threw a lot of interceptions because he had to make these read Come on, routes, brother. right? But there was a play where <laughs> we couldn't run a post against a, a quarters defense, whatever. I'm just getting a little deep, but oh, yeah. because Hakeem Nix was running a post on the backside. So in the meeting, he starts cursing at me, and he's yelling. So I'm going through my notebook. I go back to June 3rd. This Watch was like out, September. Brother. So he's going on to something else. I'm flipping through my notebook. <laughs> I get to June dirt 3rd, and I'm like, Hey, yo, coach, on June 3rd, you said we do not run a post if, Kev, if um, we have a post on the backside by the X receiver, and it's right here, and then he turned red, mm -hmm. and Eli turned back to me. Eli was like this. <laughs> My coach was like, hey, you got him. So oh, I always like the information you. because Come I can on, perform brother. the way I'm Good supposed to perform, and they'll throw shit on you, yes. and it's the rules that they, so, they taught you. Right. Real That's quick question. Okay. Man. How That's do we close the enlightenment? the enlightenment gap. You're clearly enlightened. Mm -hmm. I can name a handful of athletes, whether I've represented them before or not, that, that, that clearly are enlightened, multifaceted, multi-talented, bright, capable, but beyond football IQ. How do we close that enlightenment gap across the board with all athletes, African-American athletes? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's in your a, opinion. I think it's about giving them the space to be who they want to become. Right? A lot of these guys are pushed into this direction and they yep. never really get to explore the world. Yeah. So when you don't get to explore, you cannot discover. Mm -hmm. Right? So a lot of these guys never discover things that they're interested in outside of the sport because they was never encouraged to explore things. Mm -hmm. So once you get to the NFL, this is all you ever wanted as a kid. Why would I explore any other avenue that could possibly, this is supposed to last right. forever, but then realize that the average career is three and a half years. Mm -hmm. right. If you're lucky. I played yeah. for a decade. Mm -hmm. Right? And I ain't planning yeah. on playing for a decade. I almost retired after my third year. But they could study other no, stuff no, 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 while no, no. they're in the NFL. They, but, but, but they should. That's the thing. It comes back to time. But why would I study when I never studied? I never created the habits right. of learning or gaining information or seeking information when information is always given to me or I've got to pass got to be able to play at a high level. And then we also have you. to own up to the reality that when you also have family who is also, I, what happened to me in L.A., Talk happened in L.A., and a sister at mm -hmm. KJ uh, L.A., she said, had a photo of her son on the wall. And she said, that's my first round right there. I said, what? I said, what did you just say? Mm -hmm. That's my first round. I said, no, that ain't your first rounder. Why aren't you raising him to be the owner of the team? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And she had never, mm -hmm. she said, oh, my God. I said, why are you limiting what your son can do? Mm -hmm. You are seeing him as a first round draft pick. When my, my nephew, Chris, when he, we, we took him to the Texans game, after the game, we're there with the players and other yeah. family members. And so, uh, uh, Bum Phillips, uh, not Bum Phillips, uh, Wade. his son, Wade Phillips. Yeah, I play with Wade. Wade, Wade, but Wade comes out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wade comes out and he says, uh, Chris, how you doing? What position you want to play? I said, oh, no, I'm sorry, Wade. <laughs> Here we go. No, no, no. Chris is being raised to be an owner. Mm -hmm. And Wade was probably like, that's great. Wade was like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, I, but I needed him to understand. Right. No, we ain't talking about linebacker, running back. So right. And no disrespect to that, mm. but I needed way to understand. Yeah. Mm. Right. Here's the thing, right. though. This is what I like to call a social currency, right? In our community, if a kid that has a great jump shot walks into the barbershop, great we celebrate him. Great point. We put him up. If a kid who walks in as an honor roll student, they be like, oh, they'll come in. Like, that's the first round. He's going to be great. They don't come in with a kid who's an intellectual and be like, he's going to change the world. Come on, right. right. He's going to start the next big tech company. They never encourage right. that that way. Right. But the athlete walks in, everyone's like, great game. Everyone shows up to support his game. No one goes to their spelling bees. Mm -hmm. No come one on, goes brother. to see the black kid that's come doing on. the science right. fair, that's yeah. building the next tech robot yeah. or doing exactly. these things. So if you don't feel encouraged or in, empowered by your community, why would I stay in that field when my community celebrates this? Because every kid wants Precisely. to be celebrated right. and every yeah. kid deserves to be celebrated for what their genius is. Some kids are geniuses on the field. Uh, more kids are geniuses off the field. That's right. And they should feel like it's okay and they should feel encouraged to dream the dreams that they dream. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be play sports to feel like you're black. Which is why, which is why, to your point, which was why it was very, it was very interesting. It was very interesting yeah. when I graduated from Jack Yates. And to your point, they, what we had a number of players who went on state championship football team, guys who ran track. And they had medals, yeah, UIL medals, yeah. Mm -hmm. But with graduation, I was in school of communications. Yes, sir. I had ten medals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tops in television, tops in radio, tops in every single field. Was voted the best student whole school of communications. They gave medals for that. Oh yes, we did. That's important. So that educators so can do that. When we That's when that right. was graduation, yeah. The athletes had their medals. Right. Walk my ass across stage with my medals. And my deal was my jacket. Like we, we had Letterman's jacket. Acadi but academic wow. achievement. For school communication. See, that's, mm -hmm. that's critical. Oh, I said, R. Martin, Mr. TV. Mr. Mm. TV. That's fire. The deal. <laughs> that's fire. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. TV. Because the other students, I shot everything. High school. They'd be like, here come Mr. TV. Mr. TV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then they, that's why we go now back to graduate, back to reunion. They're like, damn, he did exactly what he was doing. But the right. key is the cats who play ball, to your point, they're retired. I'm still doing what I, what I was there. Because it's forever. Because your mind is, there your you athletic go. ability is going to lose it. You're going to lose your athletic ability. And every ball is going to go flat. But your life does not have to flat line when yeah, that ball poor, goes flat. You yeah. dropped about five <laughs> free. That's, why, that's <laughs> why I want all of y'all. <laughs> that's, 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 that's why I want all y'all to get his book, <laughs> yeah. Dear yeah, Black right. Boy. Where can they get it? No, oh, they can get it on Amazon. Actually, I'm the publisher and the printer. Come on. I picked out the paper. So <laughs> no, 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 no. No, but where can they get it where you get all of the money, not Amazon? Oh, you can shit. get it on the uh, imaginationagency.com. Okay, so give it again. The imaginationagency.com. TheImaginationAgency.com. We'll tweet that out as well. Dear Black Boy, all of y'all uh, should get your copy. We got to go, but I got to squeeze yeah, this go. one in because Martellus has never likely seen this segment. <laughs> but we always have fun with this one.
Well, he done found another crazy ass white person. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, right, y'all. So a Starkville, yeah. Mississippi couple was enjoying a holiday barbecue over the weekend when a crazy ass white woman pulls a gun on them. Here's the video. This lady Lily just pulled a gun because we out here and didn't have reservations for a lake that we didn't even know we had to have a reservation for. We didn't know, like, the only thing you had to do was tell us. We didn't, we, we didn't know, man. We didn't know. The only thing you had to do was tell us to leave. We would have left. You did not have to pull a gun. Well, I'm just telling you, you we're, we're leaving. Well, that's, that's all you had to say. That's all you had to say. Well, that's fine. That's fine. All right, y'all. Her name is Ruby Howell, and she told the couple that they needed reservations to be at the park. Apparently, the company she works for, Campgrounds of America, they don't quite agree. Guess what? Her punk ass got fired. Woo! I keep telling y'all. All right. Keep recording white people doing this. Right. And what we should then do is go apply for her job. I'm telling you. Hope we, we get we, the same if the, if the white people it, keep getting fired, we should just make a documentary. Rate. We should make a documentary about crazy ass white people doing crazy ass Boy, shit. You no, know, <laughs> no. This is, is this is this is turned into damn near a daily segment. It's yeah. so ridiculous that it doesn't even make sense. I think what happens is change happens when you this is one thing I call this a Trump effect, right? When you have someone who has such um, a big stage and they promote racism, it makes the other racism feel like it's okay because now they feel like their views are supported by someone in the highest position. People walking around with guns because someone's at a park? Right. The, like, right. oh, you're at the park? Wait, first of all, I'm not even on your grass. I'm out here. I'm like, what is this? Like, They feel like they own everything, yep. Yep. right? You do not own everything. You do not own the space. You do not own us. Like, the whole thing will, like, even like women, you don't own women. You don't do all the shit just crazy. Privilege. It's just privilege. That's this right. is real simple. That's right. If more y'all white people <laughs> keep doing crazy stuff, we get y'all jobs. We gonna You're keep right. rolling the video, and if y'all keep getting fired, y'all could help end the black unemployment rate. <laughs> so I encourage y'all to still keep acting a fool, and we're gonna keep showing y'all crazy ass white people right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Hey, I gotta go. Don't forget to support our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to make this show possible. We are independent. Nobody owns us. Not corporate. We can talk about what we want to talk about as long as we want to talk about it. We talk about black folk stuff. We're unapologetic when it comes to being black. You ain't gonna see Don Lemon wearing an African outfit on CNN. No, Not gonna happen. <laughs> oh, some of y'all some of y'all might. Oh, just in case for some of y'all out there who want to be a hater, some of y'all probably saying well, you didn't wear one when you were on CNN check your ass go see what happened when the Detroit, Detroit NAACP had their uh, Freedom Fund banquet and Reverend Jeremiah Wright spoke there okay. in 2008 go see who was on with Soledad and what was I wearing Come on. the same African outfit the white and gold was on the cover of my book listening to the spirit within Come on. I'm just saying <laughs> don't try it because I got receipts Go to RollerBartonUnfiltered.com and join our Bring the Funk fan club. Don't forget, all of you people, fan club members, you can get discount of two books uh, on uh, my site, RollerSmartin.com. Uh, of course, several different books. You already have the promo code. If you're part, okay, all y'all who use the Cash app, y'all didn't put your emails on the Cash app. That's why you have the promo code. Email me. We'll send y'all the promo code after we verify y'all paid. All right, we got to go. Y'all have an absolutely great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Ho!
You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. As Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. <laughs>